Well, you know, I had this invitation, I think probably just two weeks before uh, this t today, and it's because one of the, the conductor who was going to work here was held up because of all the restrictions. I am so happy to be standing in. The orchestra have been amazing. We had a whole day of rehearsals yesterday and uh, again this morning we have tomorrow and then the concerts on Thursday. So it's given us a lot of time to work in detail and the musicians have been so on the case and are playing so beautifully. It's really been an inspiration. Well, I was terribly lucky, you know, to, to get into conducting, actually. Um, I had studied a little. I felt, when I was a student, that the world was full of would-be conductors and what I wanted to do was make music and I wasn't going to sit around just waiting for the phone to ring to ask me to conduct for something. Having had a scholarship in Amsterdam, I came back home with no work, and the Royal Ballet were doing, were doing a ballet to a harpsichord concerto, and harpsichord was my main instrument at that time. And so I played the concerto part, and that really was the start of my being interested in working in the theatre, working in ballet. Uh, I knew nothing about it at all until that point and just walking through the stage door and seeing all the costumes and the lighting and all the different disciplines that come together to make a performance, that really excited me. As a result of that, they then needed a conductor and said, well, we believe you, you've done some work as a conductor, would you like to come here and do just... It went well, I don't know why, it was sheer luck, but it went well because I had no idea what I was doing. Um, and I joined the touring company of the Royal Ballet as a, as a staff conductor and it all really went from there. Um, and I managed also to keep my symphonic work going so that I wasn't always working in the theatre, which is, a, which is, I found, very stimulating because in order to really be successful working as a conductor in the theatre, you have to be a real team player. You have to respect all the other disciplines that must come together. Um, being a conductor for a symphony concert, is, it's much more you and your, your show. Um, and having things the way you want them. And the two sides of the, that coin really interested me, to be one day in the theatre, one day in a concert hall. I found it very refreshing. Things that have been outstanding, well, wonderful concerts. Uh, I remember going on tour with the ballet and we played in Athens in the Herodes Atticus, that wonderful open air theatre. I can remember conducting in Sydney, at the, in the, around by the harbour, we did an open air concert there. Um, I suppose it is, yes, it's the places that you conduct and the people you work with. Uh, it's been wonderful. Yes, I think, I think if I was going to put it in a nutshell, it's, it's your ability to accompany people on stage, dancers, some of whom don't read music. They all love music, but they don't have a musical education, probably, some of them. So sometimes you're being asked to do things by people who don't read a score. Then in the end, you know very well when you get down in that pit and the curtain goes up, that you're the person that's going to draw it all together. I used to, and still do, find that immensely challenging. And when it works and it really comes off, it's one of the most wonderful things. One of the things that worried me always was that if you were studying at college and you wanted to become or to work in opera, you could always go to the opera school and find out how to do it if you wanted to become a repetitor and so on. But if you wanted to work in ballet, there was really no way of getting an idea, of getting a foot in the door. So I tried when I was music director at the Opera House of the ballet company to open the doors to, to young musicians who want, might have been interested in And we've had a lot of people come through um, who found it wonderful to have as one of the things they do. Do you know, I always get, I suppose you could call it nervous, it's, it's not, it's, it's a sort of state of tension. Um, I suppose the only time I'm really nervous now is if deep down I know I haven't done enough preparation. We get tense, let's put it that way. I mean, if, if giving a performance was like going to the supermarket, it's probably time to stop, isn't it? Because it's a very special thing to do, and you do, it, it means everything to a musician to sit and play to other musicians, uh, to other people, and to make people happy, and to spread the joy of music around the world. Um, yeah, so it's a very important thing. I think that music is 
the, the greatest form of communication that we have, actually, because it, it, you don't have to speak somebody's language to understand what they're saying in music. And we musicians play with other musicians from all nationalities, from all religions, from all sorts of back, different backgrounds. And the one thing that brings us all together is our love of music. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Yes, it was way back. I was 12 years old. I was so lucky because at that time, the what they used to call it the junior department, there was a wonderful person who ran Trinity, the junior Trinity called Gladys Puttick. And I think she was way ahead of her time. She used to have musicianship classes every week for everybody who went. There would be 12 of us maybe in a class. The classes would be an hour long. And it was just a discovery of them and the developing your ability to improvise, to write compositions. Um, she was so encouraging of everybody's talents and she had that wonderful gift of treating everybody in the class differently because she understood what different people needed. And so studying and being around at Trinity College at that time was special and I believe it still is. I believe it, the, the, the Saturday work that, that is done is, is really very special indeed. Um, I had also a, a brilliant piano teacher called Richard Stangroom, who was a conductor as well, and he uh, invited me to become the accompanist to his choir. So I got all that uh, experience as a result of being at Trinity and meeting all these wonderful people. So, so lucky. Somebody was encouraging me to do what I love doing uh, and to develop all the other things that she could see that I might be able to do. No, uh, very, very special. Yes, <clears throat> that question of for young musicians now is possibly the most important thing, isn't it? It has been difficult. We all know that it's been terribly, terribly difficult. And when you're aspiring and a young creative genius, uh, you want an outlet. You want to be able to perform. That's what your life is all about. My hope is that all the musicians, the young musicians who are finding it difficult at the moment, will just remember and hold on to their love of music because that will keep them going and it will actually, when this state of, that we're living in returns to some kind of normality, um, that will still be with them. And so one's got to hold on. And actually, we musicians are very lucky that we do have music, not only for ourselves, but to please other people and to communicate with other people. I really hope that it will, the art, I know the art will survive, but I hope it will survive in as healthy a condition as it has been in. My hunch is that because people have been so lacking concerts, live concerts, they will realise even more how important they are. And when we get the, the disease under control, we will actually come back to normal and people will able to be able to do what they love doing. I think that possibly one of the things that it's, it's shown people that there are a lot of alternatives to the way we lived our concert lives. Um, I think that it's very interesting to see how orchestras will survive, maybe in smaller groups, maybe going out to schools, going out to places, going to people rather than people coming to them. And let's hope that the, the great instinct of survival will encourage us to do more, even more diverse things um, and to get our music even better and more frequently played than it is, has been up until now. Well, it's been a surreal experience. Uh, as a young composer, orchestra and orchestration is something you dream of getting the chance to do. Um, and especially after the past year or so, um, you know, you wouldn't think you'd get a large ensemble to do it in a big space. Uh, it's been fantastic. And Barry Wordsworth has just shown so much energy, verve, uh, commitment. He's been on the phone to me, emailing me, um, asking about scores, am I happy? And it's just, it's so electric seeing him conduct the orchestra in such a sort of impassioned way. And for the orchestra to be so full of my friends, um, who I've worked with so closely over the past few years, uh, it makes it all the more fitting an occasion for a premiere. Um, and it's opportunities like this that I'll cherish. Yeah, well, 
obviously a lot shut down, but I was very lucky to win two competitions, uh, one of which was the old Royal Naval College Trinity Love and Chapel Choir composition competition, which is a mouthful. Um, and I was lucky to conduct the premiere of that last week um, with Chapel Choir, which was um, really such a lovely experience. And then in December, I won the Shellhorn Prize for Sacred Music Composition, uh, which has only happened once before. So I was really grateful that it happened. And I wrote, I wrote it during COVID, so something good came out of isolation. <laughs> um, I've also returned to Trinity this year in 2021 to conduct and musically direct The Magic Figaro with Puzzle Piece Opera, uh, which was, again, such a fulfilling experience working with my friends again. And uh, although it was challenging being on Zoom, we managed to get a really fabulous production um, with singers and instrumentalists um, in March and that was so fulfilling. But just returning, to be honest, to any sort of accompanying, teaching, performing, singing, um, anything like that has been so uh, exciting after being deprived of it for so long. Well, something that's directly affected this premiere is the um, orchestration class I had with Stephen Montague and Susan Lolivar and uh, their feedback is the reason this piece is happening, really. Um, I got to learn how to orchestrate on such a large scale, which is something I've never done before. But also, in general, the feeling of um, accepting to fail um, was something I learned a lot at Trinity and something I wasn't able to accept at first. But obviously, the more you risk, um, the more you might fail, but you won't move ahead unless you do. Well, I would say that I went from a pretty sort of two-dimensional um, choral and maybe sometimes instrumental composer to having a much, much a uh, broader range of works. Um, I've got to write for orchestra, obviously. Um, I did a piece for singers mimicking domestic objects, an audio-visual experience, which I would never have done before. Um, I wrote an album of theatrical songs for myself as a singer cellist, so I got to develop as a performer as well. Um, and, but just in general, the whole range of projects I got to lead, I got to direct, arrange, compose, choreograph. Um, there was just a lot that went into a short space of time that developed skills that I wouldn't necessarily have pushed before. So Colab was such a highlight of my time um, at Trinity. In two years, I did, in the first year, arranged orchestral music, so Swan Lake, Harry Potter, um, Hall of the Mountain King, etc. for a cappella choir. We created a theat theatrical scene upstairs in a recital room at Blackheath Halls. Um, and then from then, um, we actually learned a lot during that project, which meant the next year, when I was leading a project and I had the confidence to direct it, I learned a lot from that. I mean, uh, I did a project called Project Pitch, which I co-led with a a composition student as well and uh, we did a mega mix of pop songs from the decade to close out the decade and uh, working with closely with musical theatre students gave it another sort of verve and energy that it wouldn't have had if it was just classical voice students. Um, someone I hold, hold really close to my sort of development is one of my tutors who was Erin Wallen, who I saw for brunch the other day. She's now a good friend, I'd say. And uh, despite being the busiest woman on the planet, uh, she still has time to care. She sent me a message yesterday uh, checking how the project was going. Um, she, you know, really cares and over her students and sends positivity all the way through. Uh, but also told me if my piece was boring, if it needed, if I needed to milk something, um, you know, my pieces wouldn't have been pushed without her help. And then uh, John Ashton Thomas, my other tutor, he really, um, you know, he's just the mastermind of orchestration. He spotted the most minuscule of details um, and then all his tips just really helped me uh, push further because orchestration is something I really want to do much more in the future. Um, Students-wise, there are just too many to name, but I had so many close friends in um, a composing department, the vo a vocal department and instrumentalists as well. And uh, yeah, com collaborating with them was you know, something I still do to this day. Absolutely, so um, I've worked with alumni and current students and I still do that. They're my sort of main database, I guess, of musicians and performers and collaborators. Um, apart from Puzzle Piece Opera, The Marriage Figaro, which I conducted, uh, which had um, instrumentalists and singers and some of the instrumentalists were uh, um, alumni as well. Um, I've written a short work for Puzzle Piece, which is an opera work about a tortoise, it's eight minutes long, and the pianist is Marissa Munoz-Lopez, who's now at the Academy doing the piano, but was uh, a composition student, and it was nice to work with her. But through lockdown, um, I did so many um, online arrangements, compositions, and recorded them virtually, so I, I've got a list here of a few, so I've worked with Anastasia Starman, Kerry Firth, John Sturt, Shelley Cox, Andrew Woodmansey, um, and Catherine Underhill, and a few more, but um, yeah, it, I've definitely kept in close contact. 
Yeah, I would say just immerse yourself in as much as you can, whether you're performing, creating, uh, watching, arranging. Um, you never know where you get your most bonkers ideas from and the ones that make you make your music the most interesting. And also the contacts you get from there, you know, you won't do that sitting at home. Um, sending messages and emails never um, never hurts. You never know what it can lead to. I had a massive gig with Puzzle Piece Opera through um, an application I did, which was nothing to do with it in the first place. So um, it led on to things. I think just generally, generally being a nice, responsive um, a person, very receptive and grateful for feedback, uh, really helps you along the way. It's kind of impossible to answer, isn't it? Because obviously we all want live performers and audiences to be in the same space. But obviously COVID-19 changed the new norm to be online consumption, which has uh, made it great for people who wouldn't normally be able to access um, our performers and concerts to be able to watch it. Um, so I think that will have to be uh, borne in mind as we progress into future concerts. I know this concert is being streamed for people that can't watch it, for example, which means it's more accessible for um, people who wouldn't be able to go normally. Um, but I think also um, it's enhanced our networks because you know, we haven't just had to rely on our usual collectives, we've been able to reach further. So you never know what connections can go from further on. And furthermore, um, performers have had to just be very creative and self-sufficient in their own isolation because they haven't had, they've had to develop their music without the um, resources around them. So it's, it'll be interesting to see how performers develop their work from there.